equaliser for Aston Villa. Good open up Everton here. Dublin! That's a really well worked Villa goal. Dion, welcome back, Thank first you. of all. Uh, being back here now on your old stomping ground, what are the kind of emotions that stir up inside you? Um, I wish this was my stomping ground, by the way, because this is a very nice training ground. We were stuck over there uh, where the new train tracks are going, but um, this is it's great to be back. Nice to be invited back. And it's you get a little bit emotional because you know what the players are trying to achieve and what the coaching staff are trying to achieve. The pitches out there, the goals, the balls, and yeah, it sort of takes you back and you start to think to yourself, gosh, what a good time that was. We take you back to November 1998. Obviously, you joined Aston Villa ahead of the likes of, I think, Blackburn and Leeds had come in for you. Mm -hmm. What was it overall that attracted you to the club, Aston Villa? Um, it was, it's Aston Villa, basically. It's just those two words, Aston Villa. Huge football club, history, great players, great managers, supporters which come to the ground, rain or shine. They don't really give a damn. They just want to support their team. They'll tell you what they think of you but they'll also give you the plaudits when you've done well. And all they want, Villa fans, all they want is blood, sweat and tears. If you're rubbish, they'll back you to the hill. And I knew that about Villa, and I wanted to be part of it, and I wanted to be part of that juggernaut, and uh, I'm so glad I signed. As a new player at any club, the start is so important, but yours was out of this world. Can you talk us through it? What a debut this is turning out to be. Two in under five minutes. Yeah, I got, I, I got kind of lucky to be I got lucky because, not because of the goals I scored, but I got lucky because of the players I was playing with. And it, they made my job easy, or easier, should I say, because um, the amount of supply that I got from the wings, uh, the quality of players that I was playing with, the manager was allowing me just to be a centre forward, do nothing else. Um, and to score, I think it was seven in my first three for Villa was just, it was a dream start. And once, once I nicked my first two at home against Spurs, I think I had the Villa fans on side. First goal at the Holt end, debut, I'll take that. Fantastic. Later that first campaign, during the festive season, was a match that many, many people remember. One of the great comebacks. 2-0 down to Arsenal, Burkamp double. Uh, talk us through that great 3-2 win. It was 2-0 at half-time. And uh, it was the day, it was a Christmas game, wasn't it? And it was a day that the Father Christmas hit the roof of the stand, the parachutist, got it all wrong, hit the roof of the stand and really hurt himself badly. And we knew about this. So we had to stay in the dressing rooms for a little bit longer. And therefore it gave us longer to have a bit of a debrief over the first half. Uh, Gareth Southgate had a lot to say. David James and myself nearly came to blows. We were stood up toe to toe against each other. Uh, I'm glad somebody stepped in, by the way, because he's massive <laughs> and I got a proper face, dude. Um, uh, Ian Taylor wasn't happy, Paul Merson. Was. Listen, we were devastated, two not half down, uh, half time. We put it right ourselves at half time. And to a certain degree, indirectly, Father Christmas on that day, who's well and uh, walking about now, helped us, gave us time. So uh, thank you, Father Christmas, for that little bit of extra time. We got it right and won the game 3-2. Collymore on the near post, coming in behind him, it's Dublin! It's a goal! Dion Dublin has scored! And Aston Villa from two down are 3-2 in front with seven minutes to go! Unbelievable stuff at Villa Park! 11 goals that first season. By December in the second, you'd already scored 12 goals. Amazing start, but the home game against Sheffield Wednesday stopped you completely in your tracks. Can you talk to us about the confidence you were feeling that season and the devastation of that moment? First part, confidence, I seemed to just carry on from the season beforehand. Um, I was enjoying my football. I think, I think between Coventry and Villa, I sort of had my peak performances and scored quite a lot of goals. Came to Villa and I just seemed to be on a roll. I seemed to be in what we call a purple patch as a centre forward, everything that hit me seemed to go in off my backside, off my knee, off my shoulder, it went in. And defenders knew that, so they were, I was getting marked tighter and tighter, so scoring goals was very difficult. Um, but I loved it, 
it was my job. I was being paid to score goals. I was being paid to play for Villa, by the way, which was which was uh, even better. Um, and then obviously the, the injury at Sheffield Wednesday, you say it um, sort of halted my um, my season, literally halted my season. Uh, I ran into Gerald Sibon. I thought he was going to move. He didn't move. 100% my fault. No, no fault on his part at all. And uh, I broke my neck, and it sort of literally stopped me in my tracks. I went down on my haunches, I, I couldn't feel any pain, no pain at all, nothing. And then um, Jim Walker came on, uh, the physio, and, and completely took over my, my life in regards to mobility. Jim Walker, Dr. Barry Smith, Andre Jakowski, surgeon, doctor, physio. If it wasn't for them, I'd be sat down for the rest of my life. Obviously, the Renaissance came, I think four months later, Completely different emotions. Yes. Can you talk to us a little bit about that 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 penalty because it was like an arrow. It was like an arrow, and um, I don't know if you've got any stills of the penalty before my penalty, which I think was a a Bolton miss, which meant that if I scored the fourth penalty, that Villa were going to go through to the final against Chelsea. So there's a still of all the boys like this on the halfway line, you know. Go on, go on, go on. And they missed, and everybody else is like this. I'm like this. Because I've got to take the next penalty. I'm absolutely bricking it, thinking, oh no, it's my turn, it's my turn. But I knew what I was going to do. I, I, I had the confidence to grab the ball, I had a couple of touches on my feet. I've, I've, I've watched this back many, many times because it's one of my uh, best moments in my career. Placed the ball down, took two steps backwards, looking at the ball, and then turned around, and walked away. And as I ran up to it, there was only one thing I was going to do, is put my laces to it and bang it right in that top corner. And um, on this occasion, it went right in that top corner where I wanted it to go. Is this fate? Yes, it is. Dion Dublin books Aston Villa's return ticket to Wembley. And as I turned round, I seen this sea of claret and blue running towards me and they all just engulfed me. It was just, like you say, the emotions were, were incredible. And what a time for Villa, getting to an FA Cup final. Can you talk to us about the FA Cup final? Because I presume from the highs of that were the, were the lows of actually losing the, at Wembley. Well, the build-up to the FA Cup was great. We trained well. Um, John Gregory did everything right. Uh, we didn't expect to put out a performance like that, which was a, a woeful performance for the players we had. Uh, we didn't give the fans anything to cheer about. We hardly created any chances. Chelsea were as bad as us, to be honest with you. Uh, it was the last final at the old, at the old Wembley uh, in 2000. And yeah, it was, a, it was a poor final to go out on, to be fair. And we felt very, very down about that. Very down about the performance. And very down about not giving the fans something to cheer about. Having gone that far and then just dropping away at the end. But, you know, what's done is done. And if, those, if that group of players had that chance again, we'd give you a, a different performance. We could talk to you all afternoon about the players you played with in your era, Taylor, Boateng. Don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know who they are. Never met them before. <laughs> Ekiog, Merson. Yes. But if we could focus on Gareth Southgate, your skipper. Yeah. Can you give us a, an insight into what he was like as a man and as a leader? Well, he hasn't changed at all. Um, still a leader, still a man of men. Um, He's got dignity, values, respects everybody that respects him. For, him. for him to be the England manager, no surprise to me whatsoever. I'm not even surprised. I expected him to be top of the tree. Just got a lot of quality about him, um, the skipper, a lot of quality. And as a player, um, great leader, great, great talker. Obviously, he's taken a lot of that into management now. And what he's doing for England is brilliant. But what people don't know about Gareth Southgate, even though he talks well and you know he's doing lots of interviews for, for England and the FA now and got to the World Cup, done great. All those kind of things that you see. The bit that you don't know about Gareth Southgate is he's a hard man. He's a hard man, he's a hard captain. Fair, but hard. In training, if there's a tackle to be made, if I receive the ball here and he's defending, he'll just go straight through me. If he's going to stop me scoring goals, he doesn't mind wiping me out in the fairest possible way. And if one of his players is in the way, he'll take everything out of the way and then he'll say, sorry, but you didn't score. That was his job 
and that's why we followed him into battle. Fantastic. The following campaign, uh, 2000, 2001, was one of consolidation. Uh, the next season saw plenty of things happening. Um, John Gregory left, mm -hmm. Graham Taylor came in. Can you just talk to us a little bit about what it was like to work with JG and then subsequently uh, Graham? Uh, very different. Uh, JG very relaxed. Um, uh, allowed a lot of the players to, to do what they want within his boundaries. You know, days off here, days off there, looked after the seniors. Allowed me to go away to Spain two nights after games and stuff because you knew that I was one of the older ones at 35. Probably 33 back then, but you know, um, it took its toll on the body. And then uh, uh, um, Graham Taylor comes in, you know, God rest his soul. He was different, very um, methodical, on you about manners, on you about saying excuse me, on you about saying please. Uh, and as a senior, I'm thinking to myself, I like that. I like those values. He must have been doing that for years and it's worked for him. So yes, it was all about adjusting as a player to the manager's needs at that time. But the basic need from me JG, Graham Taylor, and score goals for Mr. Dublin. Who was you told? Into Toto Cup. Into Toto Cup. We won that, didn't we? We won that smallest trophy in the world. I'm pretty sure it's about that big. And when we had to pick it up, we had to hold it like that and give it one of those ones to the punters. That's the only thing we won. Underneath, underneath the players, the umbrella of players I played with, I think that's the only thing we won as a, as a group of lads, which is devastating, really. When you think about the players that you had, and you mentioned a couple there, and I'm sure we'll mention more, but yeah, should have done more. Um, 2002, 03 was tough on everyone, especially Graham, uh, who left after one season. And obviously that campaign saw the return to the Premier League of Birmingham City. Mm. Now, I presume Derby games aren't... Who's that team again? <laughs> <laughs> Birmingham City. Birmingham, Birmingham that's it, sorry, yeah. sorry. But as has been well chronicled, probably not the best memories for you of those of those two games that season. Not really. Just, we had a stinker at, uh, at St Andrews and then I had a stinker <laughs> at Villa Park getting sent off for um, violent conduct to uh, my friend Mr Robbie Savage, which, which, which when you think about it now, it was, it was very petulant, very stupid. And, and, and Robbie did what he set out to do, was, was to, get, to get me sent off. And I, 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 I rise to the bait and completely my fault, completely my fault. Robbie done nothing wrong. A lot of people say to me, what did he say to you? What did he say to you? Was he racist? Not at all. He said nothing. It was just me. The red mist descended and Mr. Dublin got sucked into it. Robbie was smiling and I was grimacing. But uh, it happens. Do you know what I mean? It happens and I've apologised to Robbie. I spoke to Robbie since, we work on the BBC together, so it's, it's, it's not a problem, I'm a man. Obviously 2003-04 was your swan song. You're known clearly as one of the best modern day centre forwards at Aston Villa, but can you talk to us a little bit about your move to the back and also you played quite a bit with, with Olof Melbourne, yeah. just, just what it was like to play with Olof, another modern day favourite. Well, going from, first you go from centre forward to centre half. Centre forward you're creating, centre half you're destroying. Um, so, it was a little bit more simple for me to play centre-half. Still difficult, but a little bit easier because I got to see the whole of the game. I could ping a pass and I didn't mind a tackle, I didn't mind the physical aspect of the game, which you knew. Um, but playing with Olof Melberg meant that I could have a high line and he'd do all my running for me behind. I probably had Olof Melberg one side with his pace. I, I probably had J. Lord Samuel on the other side with his pace, God rest his soul. Um, and Gareth Barry and Lee Hendry and Mark Delaney, all those people doing my running for me. Doddle, easy. <laughs> As you said, I would be likely to ask you about some of the players that you played. If you, if you don't mind, a little quick fire one on some of the strikers that you played with, with at Villa. Just your okay, go on then. quick thoughts on go each on one of them, because there's on. been a few. Colin Moore? Um, a talent that could have done more, but on his game, unplayable. Joe Chin. Julian Jochin, one of the quickest players I've ever played with, one of the hardest strikes of a ball I've ever played with, with no backlift. Vassell? Darius Vassell, the man with possibly more tricks than he knew he had, and possibly confused himself so many times because he was that good. Potential-wise, possibly the best. Carboni? Benny Carboni, natural footballer. Natural footballer, left foot, right foot, good looking. Long hair, great body, came to work in a shirt and tie. What more can you say about Benny? Juan Pablo Angel? Juan Pablo Angel. 
I'm not sure if you can keep this in the video, but if I was a woman, I would. Um, yes, teammate, great bloke, dignity, standards, worked very hard on the training pitch. Luke Nillis. Luke Nillis. Legend, international legend, to be honest with you. Um, got loads of caps, didn't play enough for us, obviously, through a bad injury. Um, and a good lad, actually, a really nice lad. Crouchy. Funny. Funny man, um, normal bloke, somebody I'll be friends with for the rest of my life. Um, and he gave me a great mention on his podcast, so thank you very much, Crouchy. I'll tell you a story about Crouchy just quickly. On a pre season tour, I think I want to say Norway, pre season tour in Norway, we're all out, we've done our week's training in Norway, done a week's training, we went up this side of the road. And on that, Crouchy doesn't remember this, and I've told this story in front of Crouchy, and he has no idea. Walking down the road myself, Gareth Barry, Lee Henry, uh, the rights of self, uh, J Lord. Walking, 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 and Crouchy seen this uh, homeless person on the floor, sat down on his own, just make mind his own business. Crouchy walked across the road, we're still walking, Crouchy walked across the road, took his shoes off, like that. He had a pair of Prada trainers on, took his shoes off, put them by the side of this um, homeless man, and took the homeless man's shoes and put them on. And then just walked, so I said, You can have them, mate. Peter Crouchy in a nutshell. Uh, Balaban. Bosco Balaban. Overrated. Lazy. Didn't really want to be here. And I wish we'd never signed him. Very finally on the strikers, Allback. Marcus Allback. Now, if there, is, if, if there ever was one, he was a very funny Swedish person. Very cool, good looking, which got on my nerves. Liked a beer, which I loved to be fair. Didn't like buying them, but he liked a beer. And I had a lot of time with um, Marcus, spent a lot of time with him away from the training ground. So very nice bloke. And again, somebody that I will be keeping in touch with for the rest of my life. You obviously played for us in the Premier League. We're now in the Championship. How de delighted would you be to see us back there? It's a matter of time. It's a matter of time. Uh, the football club is a Premier League football club in stature, bar none. This, this club could be in the fourth division. As we know it, the second division now, it's still a Premier League club. It's just getting the team now to mirror the stature of the club. And I think the management we've got in, Brucey was a friend of mine, did great at Villa, had to go. He probably agrees that he had to go through the results and Villa have to move on. They have to keep going forward. They've now got Dean Smith in, who seems to be very happy to be here. The players seem very happy to have him. And if they can all get on his wavelength and his will to get Villa back in the Premier League, again, this place could be massive. Could be a juggernaut again back in, in the Premier League. Very finally, Dion, what does this club mean to you? This is a club I spent most of my time at. I had f five or six years here, playing with some great players, played under some great managers, walking out at Villa Park, scoring at the whole end on your debut. 45,000 people. This is, this, is, this, is, this is the club that made me better, a better person by learning from people around me. So yes, the bricks and mortar have got Dublin's blood in them, I think.